Carson and the cast of Queen. Geologists tried like heck to get down here, but they're up on their shifts. But they are arranging for a screening of Conalina in the Bruce Jack mine site, and, <laughs> and we're also we've gotten requests to have the screening of the of uh, Conalina in different mine sites throughout the north. A very very different kind and very very Canadian kind of distribution. Don't you think? <laughs> um, there's also somebody that I want to acknowledge who's really really key and who's also really shy, so I promised I wouldn't haul him up here. But he is the reason that we were able to film in the mining community. He is the first person in the mining community to say yes instead of no. And to my mind, he represents the future of moving forward with the environment and with industry, and it's Harvey Tremblay. And Harvey, you have to just stand up for a second. <laughs> With the uh, crew, please get up here as quickly as you can, and as you come up, I'll introduce you. And while they're coming up, I would like all of you to first of all channel the one person who couldn't be here but will be here for our second screening and will be a part of the workshop which is being put on as part of the Indie Day, and um, that is our extraordinary director of photography, Van Royko. So if you can give him a <laughs> Still up in 
the mountains with her horses. Um, but uh, otherwise she'd be here too. Okay, yes. Um, first of all, thank you so much for making that film. It's so exciting. And I, I was like driving and heard about this on CBC and was like, I really think I should go to this. And I'm really, really happy that I did. Great, so you, this woman was at the wheel, heard the interview, and came to the theater. Yeah, yeah. thanks to old media. Um, I'm actually in the documentary program at this moment at CAP. Lisa is one of my teachers, so hi, Lisa. Um, I want to know how you came up with the idea of this film, and um, what, was your, what was your process? The question is how we came up with the idea for the film, yeah, in the first place? Yeah. Um, I've had the very real privilege of traveling through the Northwest over the last 20 years. I had a real hankering for seeing landscape by horseback. I highly recommend it. Um, I've had um, the chance to get to know the land up there and, and the people in, in a way that an outsider can, obviously not the same way that the people who live on the land up there can. Um, and um, it was interesting because we were originally approached to do a film on Wade Davis's book, um, uh, Sacred Headwaters. And when I went up there, I realized that that was a book and this had to be a different kind of movie. Um, and I felt very strongly that we had to find a form that was different than a bunch of kind of smart people telling us that we're in a lot of trouble. And um, because I, as a filmmaker, was getting tired of it, and I had a hunch the audiences were too. So that put us in a position of saying, okay, if, if we're not going to um, create a film like uh, we have in the past, and I'm very, very proud of them, um, but if it's not going to be the kind of traditional character-driven film, what the devil can we bring to it? And uh, after a lot of thought and discussion, we figured it was art. And what does that mean? For us, that meant thought, trying to find the poetry in every single person in front of the lens, whether they were diamond drillers, or whether they were people protesting against them. And maybe we could cut through some of this rhetoric, this very, very strong debate that where, where there's a roar of rhetoric, but not a lot is being heard. And I think art has a role to play, to storytell, to show complexity and beauty. over to some of the people in front of the camera and kind of ask them what it was like for us <laughs> to be doing that. And just as a little anecdote, you know, it was not reassure, reassuring to that mining industry to say, oh, don't worry, we're just making a piece of art. <laughs> it didn't clarify things. Um, it's hard to describe something when you're not quite sure what you're doing yourself. Right? You're not, I think good art, you're taking risks and you're not sure exactly what the final product is going to be. Um, and that's what makes it risky. And when you hit the juice, that's what makes it good. So I'm just curious um, if any of you have a sense of what it was like to be on the receiving end of our camera. And if you thought it was different or the same from past experiences. I, 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 uh, well, I, I was involved in the resistance to the industry for almost eight years, maybe six, seven years by the time Nettie came along, so there was a lot of cameras in my face throughout that time. So, so, so when Nettie showed up, there was just another camera in my face that I didn't want. The only, the only thing we wanted was to use her immediately for the media. and. Uh, but she wanted something bigger, and this is what it is. So it took a while for me to get involved in the movie, in, in, in the project. Uh, and I worked not only, I wasn't only in front of the film, I also worked as a consultant with Ruth Language, and I did some of the audio recordings. Uh, so it, to me, it was, uh, 
it, it became amazing after the stick gambling scene. Uh, her and I, I came to Vancouver and she decided to show me some of the footage of the gambling. And uh, we were and in a stick finish. gambling scene where the, the drug is shot in slow motion. Trance. And uh, it just so happened we had a friend in Vancouver at the Blue Horizon. And we went there to look at footage. Three o'clock in the morning, we realized our friend was sleeping in, on the bed and we were in her room, so we had to leave. And that's when I got involved in it. So I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed participating in it. And I made a deal with her that, you know, if I was to get involved, I wasn't just going to be the talking head, like the, the other stuff that I've done, you know, voicing my opinion on, on what I thought was right. And uh, so. I, I got involved and I really enjoyed it. It was a real good experience. It was a good four years and a lot of talk and a lot of back and forth. I got to see a lot of the stuff that's not in the movie and uh, it was fun. Yeah. And these two, um, Frank and John, were just having a father-son experience on Totigan Mountain when our crew arrived in a helicopter <laughs> and they thought we were the mining company right? and they were pissed off. I wasn't at all happy. Um, and, and being a hunter, and when a filmmaker shows up where you're hunting, you know nothing good's going to come out of this. There's, and then when it's a Vancouver filmmaker, you know you don't have hope. Right? So I really, really wasn't very happy. In fact, it was an understatement. But, and it, and it, it took a little bit of time before I even agreed to have much to do with this thing. It was instinctive. It was, you know, it's many, right? Uh, and it was instinctive. And we were on top of a mountain. <laughs> the, the first time I saw Nettie, we were up in that alpine which you saw, and I saw her coming down a ridge with an umbrella. <laughs> and, it was her which is unbelievable. And she carried that umbrella all over. key instrument for um, a documentary filmmaker is learning how to be a lockpick, and I would say that the key instrument is an umbrella, because it covers the camera and it covers you, it's good in sun and it's good in shade, and I was traipsing across that beautiful plateau looking a bit like Mary Poppins. <laughs> I said, can you film you? <laughs> and they said, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Chad, has never seen the film. This is the first time that he's seen the film. Yeah, I, uh, I gave Nettie my word that I wouldn't watch the film until I saw it in the full cinematic experience. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of Taltan people that were talking about it, and it was pretty hard to, to resist, but I was true to my word, and, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a great film. And she originally um, approached me when I was the president for maybe. 10 or 12 days. I had just got out of uh, university after nine years in a row, and uh, I was fresh out of law school. My people really pushed me um, to become the president of the nation. So I did that. I was successful. Uh, we met, and you know, just being a, a young guy, 26, barely 27, I thought, well, you know, there's just somebody asking me to put my presidential skills to the test or something, so I said, sure, let's, uh, let's go hiking and let's go down and help out with the fish, and um, then three weeks later, I had been the president for a month, and the, uh, the Talons Pond issue happened at Mount Pauly, and, uh, you know, next thing you know, here I am, uh, three months removed from, from law school, and I get a call from Minister Bill Bennett, and the uh, president of Imperial Metals, and they're like, yeah, your, your people are up there, they're having a blockade, it's uh, it's time for us to hop a private jet, and we're going to go up to Tal Ten territory, and you're going to have to deal with this. So I just said, well, let's, let's do it, and uh, you know, it was, a, it was a very difficult, challenging time period, but you know, a few months down the road, we we worked through it, and uh, Red Chris is, is up there now, and I think that you did a good job capturing the... Uh, the yin and the yang of the complexities that, you know, different Taltan generations uh, grapple with because people want the employment, people want to, to be empowered and drive nice vehicles and put their kids in hockey, but people also want to protect the environment up there. So 
I think you did a great job in the film showcase, and that, I was honored to be a part of it. Well, it was amazing when that scene happened. There were several times when Oscar has said to me, you have no idea what you're filming. And he's right. And I think that's one of the things that was really um, extraordinary, is that these people allowed themselves to be so very vulnerable for our, to our camera. Yeah. I have a question for Hildegard Westerkamp. Um, it seems like the, the, the editing, the visual editing is quite complex and I was impressed with the complexity of the sound in the movie and I'm wondering if Hildegard could comment on whether it was particularly challenging or <laughs> how it felt for her. So this question is to Hildy, but I'm also going to throw it open to the whole team. And it's asking how hard or how easy was it to do this soundscape, which stitched picture and sound together to create some kind of whole here. Uh, I would say thanks to Nettie's incredible direction. Um, some of the hardship was eased over time because we really communicated incredibly well together. Uh, it was challenging for me personally because I haven't worked in film since the 80s. And so technologically I was not up at all to scratch. And so I was incredibly grateful to have Mark Lazeski um, as the real sound designer who, who did in fact the sound design for the entire film. Um, Jesse and I were the composers and we, I would say we um, supplied uh, Mark and also Daniel Pellerin, who was the final um, sound mixer, is that the official term? Um, with our sound materials, with our sort of composed sections that we thought should go into certain areas of the film. But of course the sound designer takes any composer stuff and throws it around in different directions and then does a marvelous job composing the entire film. And so I, I really would like to give a particular acknowledgement to Mark, who did most of the job, just like Michael did most of the visual editing. Okay, I'll try it on a little bit. Um, I found this particular um, scenario to be, it wasn't interesting concept because we try to meld musical composition with sound design as much as humanly possible. So for me, I initially kind of um, created a lot of actual musical pieces and um, it took a while to understand that because in, in documentary film there is a huge amount of dialogue, obviously. And also space is extremely important. So um, it was interesting to give large, larger pieces of musical work to a scenario and then have it become stripped away and end up with little bits and pieces and things that come in and out and flow in different directions and stuff. So it was a, an, an enjoyable experience in the end to see this come come to this place. And this comes to also, um, I have to say, that if there had been one person who was all wrapped up in ego, we would have been sunk. But instead, I had this extraordinary sound team who were passing music cues, effects back and forth and back and forth. Jesse had his music run forward and backwards. It was extraordinary what happened. And um, I think in the end, you know, we ended up with something really magical. You know, the hardest part, I think, was that when we're dealing with images of, um, the big thing with all of the making of this film was to park your assumptions, park what you thought about industry, park what you thought about First Nations and just go forward and mine them, to overuse a metaphor, to find um, the juice, to find where the art and the poetry is. And so we had to really pull back any time that the image or the sound commented on something. It was really important, and so 
it, it was very easy for when you're dealing with images of industry to go into melancholy or dark shades and we would have to try and pull that into the light and I think um, you know it was a struggle but I think it really paid off and I've got to say too that the sound design had a huge spine laid for it by Michael he's one of the reasons why he's such a good editor is that he edits both sound and picture so a lot of the cuts are pushed by the sound and so we had a a wonderful blueprint, wouldn't you say, Mark? Uh, given to us by, by Michael. Yeah. No, Nettie, unfortunately, we only have a couple of minutes. I see someone with their hand up. Shall we take a question? Hi, uh, that was a great movie. Thanks a lot for showing it to me. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'd like to hear from um, sort of the locals from out there as well. Uh, I think we're at a world stage right now, especially in that. A part of the world uh, in terms of conservation and environmental awareness. And I'd like to you know, get your perspective on how do you think this film helps create awareness and what can young filmmakers do to also be a part of this effort to try and create more awareness about um, these situations with if it's Site C Dam or LNG pipelines and ways we can create more awareness or what we can do as young filmmakers to. So the question is can. Can filmmakers make a difference? Is that what you're asking? I think. Uh, no, no, I'm asking what we should do in terms of, like, I want to create pieces as well to create awareness about the issues that are going on in our province that are to do with multi corporate um, investors that are trying to um, extract our resources and um, so the question is, lost, but, uh, what should you? Trying, what I'm trying to get is what, what can people who want to make the world know about the problems that we're having in our province? The people who don't want the site to dam, LNG pipelines, and environmental extraction. What can we do to create more awareness about these? Okay. Making films is a good way. You, you mean beyond that? This, this is not a super politically charged piece. But I feel like I came to watch it to see what's happening right now in our province with, with this situation. And I, I did get a piece of what's going on, but I feel like it's really important to tell these stories about what's going on in our in this province because it's on a world stage and we need to tell these stories. Well, I, I think, does anybody here want to respond to that? Well, one of the, there's, there's, a, there's a filmmaker in the audience, his name is Tom Campus. He, uh, he, he did a lot of work with us in, in the resistance to uh, Fortune Minerals. And uh, what he did was, as a filmmaker, he came up into the sacred headwaters and we used his skills immediately for the media and it played a huge role in our success. So in that sense, he contributed as a filmmaker, but it's so complex, I mean, there's so much. I mean, it depends on what you want to accomplish, like if you're for mining, if you're against mining, if you're not against either. So my question to me is kind of, general, uh, but uh, that's, that's one example. Yeah, it's a very complex, uh, every project up there is complex. The uh, opinions of the generations, the younger generation versus the older generation is very complex. The um, contrast between the local perspective of Taltans and the Taltans that live outside because you gotta realize that only 25% of the Taltan nation lives in the traditional territory. So there's a lot of issues back and forth, but at the end of the day, we have a very comprehensive, what I call inter-consultation process, which is the consultation that we have internally amongst ourselves. When we want to um, go through a process of hearing from the nation about whether or not we want to support a particular project the president, our negotiation team, our environmental team actually goes out to 13 different communities where there's you know, a large delegation of Taltan membership across BC, across the Yukon, and then I even added Edmonton because I did my undergrad in Edmonton. I wanted an excuse to go there last year. But there's a lot of Taltans there as well. And I guess to answer your question, what I would say is that let the Taltans go through their internal processes first let us take the lead on different issues, and then we'll reach out in a big way through um, you know, our different channels, and at that time we would love to obviously be embraced by British Columbians with 
with our fight. And on that note, I'll just you know mention one soundbite now is that right now we do we Oscar calls it resistance, so I could use that word, but we do have elders resisting resident hunters in our territory, and there's a lot of um, conflict going on on the ground between Taliban and resident hunters. But at the end of the day, the larger issue, it's not about Taliban rights or the resident hunter rights, it's about holding the province accountable to make sure that they invest more money into you know, wildlife conservation and stuff like this. So it's all about being properly informed and letting the Taliban's take the lead. And I'm happy that Oscar cited some examples where other filmmakers have come up and helped us in our fights. I wish we had more time. <laughs> Thank you, Nanny, and let you make some concluding remarks. Yeah, I just want to ask you to do me a favor. If you think Conalina is worth it, I'd like to ask you to become our army of alternative publicists. And there's a number of ways that you can do that. Behind you, um, you'll see that we are going to be opening at the Van City for two weeks on October 28th. Please tell your friends about that, and on your way out, there's going to be people who are can't, um, handing out old bits of old media, which are flyers that you can take home and stick on your fridge, or you can go to our website, which uh, will tell you times, not only where we're playing here in Vancouver, but across the country, and if you know people in various different um, uh, towns where we're playing, please encourage them to come. We have sign-up sheets outside where you can subscribe to our newsletter so you'll know uh, where we're going to be. And finally, we have a, oh, and vote too. <laughs> it's really important for an independent film like this. If you, again, if you think quality is worth it, do vote on your way out. And finally, there's a really interesting project which is a companion piece to Conalina. And it's an interactive website which is created by our pals at OneNet. And it's called um, North Through South. And you can, you just kind of part the ways there, Mark, just move back a little bit. NorthThroughSouth.com is a site where we asked people to embrace um, art and take it into controversy and turn it into poetry. And we reached out to five young artists in uh, urban centers in, in southern BC to interpret five characters in Conalina. And the humans who are here tonight somewhere, um, who gave an amazing concert on Saturday night, interpreted Oscar, for instance. And so you see Oscar and Oscar's dad, you hear them speaking Toltan, and this is mixed into this extraordinary electronic music that the humans are doing. And there's a body painter and a graffiti artist and a choreographer and a hip hop po poet. Check it out. It's a mind twist and it's, uh, I, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. All of that is a part of, I think, um, Conalina using art to turn controversy into poetry and storytell, perhaps in a different way. So thank you for doing all of that. Thank you all for coming.